Welcome to our Finnovate webinar. I'm David Penn, Research Analyst for Finnovate, and I'm joined by Jeff Kane, Senior Director of the InvestNet Yodley Incubator, Kumar Ampani, who's the Chief Technology Officer at Movin, and Dr. Jason Mars, who's the co-founder and CEO of Clink. Welcome to everyone. I also want to let you know that we're going to be live tweeting this webinar, so you can join in the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag FinnovateWebinar. So the idea of this webinar was to get together with a few of our most successful Finnovate alums, all best of show winners, by the way, and to have them tell the story of, quite frankly, how they did it. Every company and context is different, but by learning and gaining insights from those who are making a mark in this industry, we think we're going to help pave the way for the next generation of fintech innovation. Uh, before I hand it off to our guests to find out about their experiences, I'd like to remind all of our listeners that we're going to be holding an interactive Q&A after the presentation. So if you have any questions during the presentation, you can send them to us using the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. So with that, let's go ahead and start off with our first presenter, Mr. Kumar Ampani, who's the Chief Technology Officer at Movin. Kumar. Thank you, David. Uh, hi, this is Kumar Ampani, Movin. Um, today I'd like to give you a quick overview of uh, what we're doing at Movin and what's working for us. Movement began with a simple idea. Banks need to help people understand their financial choices, motivate them to make good choices, and enable them to take effortless actions. Movement delivers a smart banking experience that blends financial advice and banking in one, enabling customers and our partners' customers to meet their rising expectations. Today's banking is all about accounts, transactions, and balances. Movement is not designed around those. Movin was designed around customer behavior. It's designed to change the customer behavior so they spend less and save more. We do that by giving a real-time instant insights into their financial wellness. We believe the future of banking depends on effortless banking. The banking in the future will be simple, secure, and seamless. In order to eliminate the artificial barriers preventing people from accessing basic core banking features. Contextual advice. People's banking data belongs to them. Banking needs to use this data to provide insights and solutions to the customers, which will help them to better manage their finances. And the third one is liberated experience. Banking experiences must be unchained, device agnostic, and delivered when and where people will need them. These three pillars taken together will enable the new global money experience that will sit above the core banking in a new customer-focused engagement model. What's our model? We developed two distinct but complementary lines of businesses for distributing our solution. One is direct to consumer. This is what we call downloadable free bank. Um, it's available in the App Store, where users can download our app and sign up for a bank account in less than three minutes. For users who don't want to get a bank account, they can sign up for a, what we call freemium model. In this model, users can link their existing accounts and get the same wellness features that we offer to our bank customers. We also use this line of business as our innovation lab, where we roll out, measure, refine, and perfect all our new features before going to the second model, which is our uh, enterprise. In this model, we provide the movement wellness experience to our enterprise partner customers by white labeling or co-branding the app, which is heavily focused on customer experience with wellness to increase the engagement. So why do we have these two models? The unique dual model provides a rapid market-proven innovation for our banking partners. We roll out all new innovative features to our D2C market, where we measure the reception, refine, and redeploy. Once the feature is perfected and measured, the success, we then roll these to enterprise customers. And reverse this too, too, where we get unique feature requests from our enterprise customers, we develop, measure, and then we get them back into our core product. Now, Movement Smart Banking app offers unique ways to acquire, engage, and grow the customer base. For acquiring, we have a simple frictionless sign-up process with straightforward feature optionality. And then we engage our users with financial wellness insights with the ability to explore further with minimal friction to see, explore, and act on the information. So finally, the growth. The behavior of gamification makes the customer use the app more often than your regular banking app. 
this engagement can be converted to opportunities like savings, deposits, or credits. For example, every time a move-in customer swipes their debit card or taps their phone to make a purchase, in fewer than two seconds, we give them awareness if they're overspending in a specific category like dining or how is their overall spending. Another example, every morning a customer wakes up to a daily digest of yesterday's spending. And if it's in their best interest to tuck away some savings towards an emergency cash fund, we give an actionable recommendation to save, say for example, $100 with one frictionless and secure tap of their phone. Another example is, Movement's app security model that supports a seamless mobile experience across channels like WatchOS, Android Wear, widgets, without compromising on privacy and concern and security. So what's working for us? Well, it starts with our team. We have some of the brightest uh, folks who are passionate about financial technology and customer experience. The second thing that's working for us is our customer focus. The customer experience that we designed with the intuitive user interface that is frictionless and actionable. And the third one is the cloud. The cloud offers many benefits in terms of security, efficiency, and scalability. We built a great infrastructure as code. We call it Movement Global Distributor. This enabled us to take agile method to the extreme with advanced continuous delivery, radical development efficiency, and high quality environment management. As a result, we can deploy entire enterprise financial wellness and banking stack in any part of the world in a matter of hours. This model supports globally replicated multi-tenant model that segments client data in each country while still enforcing a reusable model across all the clients. And the fourth one, the very important one is working with our bank partners across the globe. We are not trying to compete with the big banks, but we are working with the big banks help them grow their customer engagement, which results in new opportunities like savings, credit, deposits. And some of our partners are even looking into use our platform to integrate with the third parties, like our panelists, like, you know, Clink, for example, where we have all the data curated, analyzed, and stored in a secure fashion with, with infrastructure where we can quickly and securely provide access to that data. I don't want to leave out my other panel, panelists, Yordley. We're already using Yordley for, uh, for our aggregation. So with that, thank you. I'm, I'm going to take it over to Jeff. Hey, Kumar, thank you very much for that. That was very, very interesting stuff. Uh, we'll come back to that with some, uh, some questions. Some, already, some questions have already popped up on the, the Q&A. But um, very interesting technology from, from Move, and I had the opportunity to speak with uh, uh, Greg Mitbo, uh, your chief revenue officer, earlier this year, and uh, very, very interesting stuff happening there. I just want to remind everyone that if you haven't already done so, I encourage you to submit your questions uh, through the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. As I mentioned, we've got a few coming in and uh, already off to a great start. So let's go ahead and uh, transition next to our, our next uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Jeff Kane, who's the Senior Director at the InvestNet Yodley Incubator. Jeff, go ahead and take it away. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, David. Good to be here. So yeah, I run our incubator, so we take startups every year and try to accelerate their growth. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Yodley's history, then about the lessons I've seen from working with now three classes of startups. Uh, and if I do this right, those things are all going to actually tie together nicely. But first, um, I want to talk a little bit about, about why this is so important. You know, we have started presenting statistics in, in many of our presentations. You know, one in three Americans has zero dollars saved for retirement. Eighty-five percent of Americans are stressed out about finance. Sixty-five percent of Americans are losing sleep over their finances. And compare that to 35 percent losing sleep over health care. Um, you know, finances are incredibly important. People in, in America and worldwide are not in great shape. And, and those of us in fintech have an opportunity to really improve people's lives. And I think it's good to remember that. Uh, you know, Movens product does that. Clink enables their customers to do that. We all have an opportunity to really uh, improve the world here. And I think that's exciting. And that's, that's part of why we're all doing this. So I just want to sort of put, put that in context. And that's certainly what, what Yodley's been focused on since 1999 when we were founded, uh, thus making us in some ways the world's oldest startup. Our, our mission has always been to aggregate financial data and make it available for applications that can improve 
how users manage their money. And we've been through, through a number of iterations. We've been consumer-facing. We've been business-facing. We sell to banks. We sell to startups. Uh, but through, through the path over the past 17 years, the absolute focus has always been build this incredible database, keep it secure, make it available, apply analytics, and let our customers help their customers. Uh, and so as we've been doing that, we've built this amazing platform. We've got data from over 15,000 sources worldwide. We've got 22 million active users coming through. It's this giant platform that we keep secure and available worldwide, yada, yada, yada. Um, and three years ago, we said, let's, let's build an incubator on top of this platform. Let's go out and find entrepreneurs who want to do really interesting things with this financial data and give them the resources they need to bring those things to market and accelerate their growth. So we started doing that, and somewhat standard corporate incubator, a uh, six-month program. Companies get free access to the API. They get mentors. They get experts. They get access to the Yodley ecosystem. Uh, we've now done three classes of eight companies each, so 24 companies have come through the program. At this point, I think I'm starting to see some, some patterns emerge. You know, The companies include mortgage application software, investment analysis, We've had a challenger bank, we've had digital payment solutions, personal financial management tools, alternative credit companies, a wide range of fintech solutions have come through here. And one of the interesting things is, you know, fintech startup shares a lot of DNA with a tech startup. Most, most of what you need to do to succeed as a fintech startup is exactly what you need to do as a regular tech startup. Um, you know, you need to sort of follow that lean startup mentality. Um, you know, be customer centric, build a good product, scale your business. Um, and so, what are some of the specifics? What have we seen that works really well? Um, one is focus. Stay focused on the problem you're trying to solve. Um, you know, and that's sort of the, the lesson of Yodley over our 17 years. We have stayed focused on building this this data platform. So, you need room to pivot. You need room to adjust. But you also need to be focused, uh, particularly when you're a two, three, four-person team. You simply don't have the cycles to be doing a lot of experiments. You need to sort of stick to your knitting and drive forward. Um, you know, the companies that, that get the most traction in our program are highly customer-centric. You know, again, this is standard tech stuff. Talk to your customers, whether that is through conversation, whereas that is looking through looking at data of how they're using your application. Make sure that you are close to your customer and solving their problems. Be highly product-focused. Um, you know, one of the, the challenges we've seen is particularly uh, founders who come more from the business side, and I say that as, as a biz dev guy who's also founded companies, um, sometimes the business founders are not as close to the product as they need to be. They're not as product-centric. They're spending time on distribution strategy and partnerships. Um, particularly in the early stages, that's not necessarily the best use of time. So be highly product-focused. Uh, and it's especially true in fintech. Here's where a fintech startup is different than a tech startup. Your product has to be right. You have to be accurate. You have to be secure. Um, you know, if an if a average social app fails or provides some bad data, no one really cares. If you present bad data on somebody's budget, they're probably never going to use your app again. So you have to be doubly product-focused when you're a fintech startup. Um, we've had a bunch of companies sort of not do great time management. Running a startup is hard, again, especially in the early stages, and you need to be really, really tight with your time, particularly at the CEO level. Um, you know, I had a CEO spend an entire day designing a logo in some sort of graphics program. That is not a good use of a CEO's time. Um, we sent him to 99 designs, and $200 later, he had a serviceable logo. So, you know, again, this is like any other startup. Be very focused with your time. Leverage your resources. Um, one of the advantages of our incubator is we have over 70 mentors and experts that are available to answer questions to do virtual office hours. And some of our companies graduate from the program never talking to any of them. Um, it's like throwing money away. That makes no sense. Any, any startup has access to people, friends, folks you meet. If they offer to help, take them up on that offer. Um, so, again, leverage the resources. 
be scrappy. Uh, you know, some some startups are great at raising money, and then you can you know install foosball tables and serve kind bars to everybody, and that's awesome. If you're not one of those startups and raising money is not always easy, then don't be profligate. Uh, make sure to be scrappy and take advantage of free stuff. Um, the other thing we always tell our companies, and this is where fintech is different than tech, regulation matters in fintech. Um, you know, you are not when you're dealing with the Federal Reserve or the OCC. These are serious agencies that do not mess around. This is not like the Lincoln, Nebraska Taxi Commission. Um, they will shut your company down. So be thoughtful and be smart. And kind of the, the final bit of advice that we are we are giving companies is provide actionable intelligence. I mean, you know, everybody, all our applications mention AI. It doesn't need to be AI. You can provide actionable intelligence through a, a good spreadsheet, but give your customers something to do. Tell them, here's, I've got access to a lot of data, and I'm advising you to do X or to do Y. Um, that is what users are looking for now. That is what all the companies are doing. And that's what, what Yodli, after 19 years, you know, we've, we've built more and more of that. We've sort of moved up the stack a little bit. We've got this data, and we're analyzing the data and providing our customers with intelligence. So those are, those are kind of my bits of advice and thoughts from watching, again, 20, 24 startups come through, some of which have succeeded, some of which have failed, some of which are still kind of bouncing along, and I talk to them regularly. So hopefully that is helpful. Excellent. Really great stuff, uh, Jeff. It's, it, I particularly appreciated uh, the way that you showed that, yes, fintech is tech, so there are some similarities, but there are some, some very critical differences that you highlighted, particularly with regard to product focus and, and regulation, some things I suspect will get touched on the, on the uh, other questions as well, but very, uh, very helpful digest, I'm sure, for the folks who are listening in uh, in terms of some of the things they need to be sort of checking off as they, as they put their teams together. Um, let's go ahead and move to our third uh, panelist of the day, Dr. Jason Mars. He is the CEO and founder of Clink uh, out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, Jason, if you're ready, let's go ahead and start with you. Yeah, sounds great. Um, so, hi, everyone. I'm super delighted to be here uh, participating in this with uh, uh, some brilliant colleagues and, and, and minds in the field. Um, I really admire um, uh, Moven and Yodli, so... Uh, uh, so that's that's awesome. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about Clink, what we do and who we are, uh, and then I'll get into some of our story uh, and tell you about the lessons, what's challenging, what were the obstacles, what my thoughts of advice are. So Clink is a company we started in 2015. Uh, so uh, there's uh, some AI technology we've been building in a lab for intelligent assistance. We saw a huge opportunity to bring this technology to market in a way that uh, provides experiences that, that we believe leapfrogs the current experiences you have. Uh, you know, the key uh, uh, benefit of what we, what we have is this ability to understand super messy human language. So if you say something in a messy human way, um, uh, the system understands and it's super robust while much of the other tech in the space is uh, uh, is, is pretty brittle, being that it's using techniques from uh, classic uh, natural language processing. We're using deep learning uh, uh, in a way uh, that is novel. Uh, it's entirely data-driven. We don't have uh, the notion of, of, of nouns and verbs and adjectives. I often say that you probably don't remember the last 10 adjectives I said. Uh, it, it actually learns by training uh, pathways in neurons with just data. Uh, and so uh, it has this ability to recognize things that resembles an experience the, the brain has had before. So you can say super messy, long uh, uh, queries, and you can rely on it to uh, actually understand you. Um, so, so, you know, and you can check us out. You can, there's a number of videos if you're curious to kind of learn more of what we do. Um, you know, our, our business model is to work with financial institutions to integrate this kind of Siri-like experience, a super-duper smart Siri experience, but for your financial story. Uh, so we're working with partners of large financial institutions right now on uh, uh, pilot rollouts and production rollouts uh, of this tech. And I'll talk a little bit more about what's going on there when I kind of tell you the journey that we've been on. All right, so now for the good stuff. And this is the kind of candid stuff that um, you often won't hear. Uh, you know, I'll kind of bear the soul of the company. So... When we started, uh, we, uh, 
um, you know, we did a seed round after, you know, myself and two other co-founders uh, thought we could change the world with what we were building. We did a seed round uh, uh, with a local group here in, uh, uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, right? We did $1.2 million deal with them to get, get the ball rolling, started our office, um, and, uh, you know, we had about maybe six employees at that point after the seed round. Um, the nice one key piece of advice I'd say when doing rounds of funding is start talking to uh, investors early, right? Uh, let them work with you to shape your story. Uh, I've seen a lot of startups and colleagues uh, have this idea that, oh, they have to get the business idea perfect, and then they'll present it to investors. But my suggestion is to take your gut, take what you want to do, uh, and put it in front of super smart um, um, investor people, uh, 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 and build those relationships. Let the investor give you that feedback that will help you shape the vision. And, you know, you can end up having a company that looks – or a pitch or an idea that looks a little bit different from what you started with. Uh, and then, you know, that's, that's actually the way that you can get uh, the kind of relationships you want to take you to uh, uh, awesome valuations in the future. Um, so we did that seed round. Toward the end of the seed round, you know, and this is uh, leading up to Finnovate. So we went in stealth mode to build out uh, this financial uh, assistant. We wanted to do the 90% product to help people be connected to their financial stories, ask questions like, oh, crap, how much, you know, did I drop on beer in the last two months? Uh, is it, you know, uh, is my spending on groceries going up these days? Like, uh, these kinds of questions. Or should I spend $400 on shoes this month? Um, so we, we built that out in stealth mode, uh, and we targeted launching – uh, uh, at Finnovate, right? Uh, so we actually signed up for Finnovate. We paid a bunch of money to get that stage. This was the big culmination of what we were in stealth mode for. Uh, and so we worked tirelessly, like we into the wee hours in the morning uh, leading up to this launch because, be, and this is key for, I think, winning best of show, beyond just talking about what we were doing and showing a scripted demo, we wanted to take the next step and let people play with our tech at, at our booth. And so I think that was a huge uh, differentiator and, and I think led to a lot of success. The fact that we have this show, don't tell kind of approach, being that there's so much noise in the community uh, that has served us really well. So we did that. Uh, but one interesting thing is while we were doing that, we were getting a lot of pressure from uh, the VC company while we were in stealth mode targeting September 8th was the launch date. Um, it was about a year uh, later from the investment round. Um, we got a lot of pressure from the investors to focus on building up customer base, right? Because for the next round of funding, it's critical to have customers that uh, are lined up, that will give you good reviews, uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, so they were pushing us to do that while, you know, we actually were heads down focusing on product. Um, after launch, they got it, right? But it took a lot of uh, kind of finessing to kind of keep the pressure off of focusing on sales uh, and focus on building out a world-class experience that could, you know, put, our, put us on the map uh, uh, in the space. So sometimes if you, as a CEO or a leader, have a vision that you understand, sometimes it's okay to diverge from what you're hearing from your investor that is like your best friend, right? Um, so you've got to navigate that, and you've got to do what you believe in, and it worked for us in spades. After we launched, we rapidly engaged a number of financial institutions and got those you know, glowing reviews and recommendations uh, against the competition. I'm not going to name names, uh, but um, uh, uh, that was huge for us. So we did a Series A just about three months after launching uh, that closed in January of, of uh, $6.3 million. This is in the news. Um, and so that was – uh, that was awesome. We've grown to 35 people, uh, uh, and you know now we're doing some deep, deep rollouts with the one of the largest financial institutions. We're actually planning to announce something huge at Money 2020, where we're going to bring partners on stage to demo the products we've built with them. Uh, one of which is this Alexa integration, where we essentially replace the Alexa stack with Feeny, so you can kind of use utterances that Alexa can't even support. Uh, and it's created shockwaves in this financial institution, so that's going to be super exciting. But um, let me just take a minute to just touch on uh, a couple of the other big points I want to mention. Um, you know, uh, it's critical to uh, cut through the noise when you present at, 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 at Finnovate. There's going to be a lot of companies with similar narratives, uh, and 
providing the, if you're doing something for the experience of, of consumers in the financial sector, one thing we've noticed is when you provide the experience, that differentiates you. So, um, you know, uh, you can kind of describe what you're doing. You describe the vision. But if you let the product speak for itself, you don't have to spend that much time differentiating yourself. That's one thing I've, I've learned, and I think it gives you a lot of traction uh, for being successful um, um, uh, uh, in, in, at Finnovate. How much time do I have left? Uh, just curious. Oh, I think you're fine. If you want if a, a couple of, another point or two. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so sales team, here's one big thing. So we've got a couple um, folks, we've got a couple sales folks that I think are phenomenal just at sales, but uh, they come from an enterprise sales world. Um, so one thing I would absolutely recommend when it comes to formulating your sales strategy is bringing on someone that has a couple years of experience in fintech selling to banks, if you're selling to banks. Um, you know, uh, the thing is we're going through kind of a learning curve that I think is, is, is larger than it needs to be. Now, we've been really successful. We actually have signed deals with three financial institutions uh, that are massive, right? We, we took the approach of going to the large banks first, and we have a number of signed deals uh, that are, you know, kind of production rollout uh, trajectory deals, uh, one of which we'll announce um, um, soon. But, uh, but I think that it's critical when navigating the organization in the financial institution, understanding the churn that goes on, what to do when the person that's your best contact that's getting your deal through, when he leaves to join another financial institution, what do you do with your lead, right? Um, you know, how do you navigate the politics? The politics is crazy. One bank might be really good when it comes to innovation team pushing tech into product, but another, another financial institution may be terrible at it, and the inv innovation team is kind of a, a, a sandbox sinkhole abyss where you will be doing deals with them and getting money, but they don't have the political gravitas to be able to push you into the product uh, production pipeline. Just navigating these and being able to understand and recognize quickly what's going on uh, having a, a salesperson that has that experience is just huge. Uh, we recently brought on the a director uh, of product uh, at FIS Mobile, and since he's come on, he's had this insider knowledge that has accelerated us maybe 10x with uh, our kind of uh, uh, deal flow. So I'll leave it at that, and I'm happy to take questions uh, along with uh, my great colleagues, uh, Jeff and Kumar. Excellent. Thanks again, uh, Jason. A lot of a lot of great points in there, and I have to admit, sandbox sinkhole is uh, is a line I'm going to have to steal for some uh, for some purpose. That really that really does sum up uh, the the downsides um, of, of those institutions who are really struggling to to make innovation really a, a part of their a part of their culture. Um, I just wanted again to remind folks we have some questions that have come in already, but I want to remind those listening that if you do have a question, we still got time to get uh, to get that question in. All you have to do is submit your question to the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. We have a few queued up, and we'll uh, we'll go ahead and try to answer them. I think in the order that they came in. So let me go ahead and take a quick look and see what we've got. Uh, here's our first question, and what I'll do is I'll just uh, present the question to each of you sort of in the order that we presented, starting with, with Kumar and then uh, moving to Jeff and then to Jason, giving each of you an opportunity to take a crack at this one. Um, our first question is, uh, this is interesting, what one word describes what made your startup successful and why? Uh, the first question, and let's go ahead and send that to Kumar, and then again we'll check with Jeff, and then we'll see what, uh, what Jason thought on that question. What one word describes your company's success and why? Well, one word. <laughs> Maybe three. <laughs> I'll, I'll go with focus. I'll go with focus and focusing okay. on changing the customer behavior uh, to, to, to better manage their finances. So I would say I would go with focus. Excellent. Uh, Jeff, how about you? You know, I, I'm with Kumar. I would say focus, too. The, the fact that Yodli spent these 17 years um, building this, this data pool um, and sort of said, this is what we do, and we're going we're gonna to find various ways to monetize it is what made it successful. You know, obviously, the, you know, the technology is essential. You know, Yodli effectively invented this concept of data aggregation on the web. Um, yeah. So you, you got to have that, but I almost feel like that's a that's a necessary but not sufficient condition. 
Mm-hmm. Well put, well put. Jason, how about uh, how about you and Clink? One word uh, to describe, and then why so? Yeah, no, absolutely. Actually, when you asked the question, the first thought that came to my mind was focus as well. But let me add yeah. another one, uh, focus and grit. Now, focus, I'll add the caveat to focus that um, once you refine your vision in the earliest phases and you know what you want to do, that's when you turn on focus and you put the blinders on and you just – heads down and you nail it. Grit is incredibly important as well. And when I say grit, I mean, you know, knowing that, you know, keeping a standard for yourself and the way you execute be, to be extremely high. One thing that we do at Clink is we stay ahead of our customers because it turns out when you're doing these integrations, there's work on both sides. Uh, and we will do uh, four steps ahead of our, 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 our partners so that they can present and demo progress, even if they're not making it for security reasons or regulatory reasons on their end that's stalling the project. But we keep it at a level where if we're working in tandem, we go all hands on deck and stay up till four in the morning to stay ahead two or three steps, right? We keep that optic strong so that our customers know that, whoa, this company isn't just really good and just technically strong, but with them, I can trust that even if I'm slipping and falling, I'm going to be good because I can be safe with these guys, right? So to maintain that optic, which, you know, I think a lot of folks might, might have the mentality like, oh, well, the ball's not in my court. The ball's in their court. So, you know, when they get their act together, we'll, we'll get our act together. You know, we go beyond that, and we do it in a way where if we have to stay up till 4 in the morning to stay multiple steps ahead to make them feel safe, we'll do it. And that takes grit. So I'll say focus and grit. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Those were de- focus is definitely something that came through in all three of your of your presentations, and in somewhat different ways each each time, which is very very interesting uh, stuff. Let's uh, go to our next question here, and this is actually something that I've uh, I wondered about a little bit in my little list of questions. And uh, again, we'll we'll uh, present it to everyone. Uh, the question is B two B versus B two C in fintech. What is the data showing? Who is getting better traction, growing faster, and getting easier funding is the question. And uh, love story to you, Kumar, because you sort of addressed the idea of these two business models and actually a sort of the unique way they're working for movement. So let's go ahead and start with you with that question. So um, I, I don't have any numbers of, uh, right now, but uh, we're the only ones, I guess, in this space. We're doing both B2C and B2B. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, we got the funding. We're doing both. So I can't speak for you know which one is uh, is better for funding and all. But uh, um, I, I can tell you what we're saying. Uh, B to C, uh, it, it's hard to get the customers, in, in, in especially fintech or finance side, right? You have mm-hmm. a, 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 a credibility gap there. Whereas you know we we do have innovation uh, advantage, but we have credibility gap. But in the B2B model, those two are tying nicely together. You know, we, we bring the innovation and, and the big banks bring the credibility and the, the scale um, to, you know, to the product. Um, so that's kind of working great for us. Um, and as, as, I said, as I said, funding, and I don't have numbers on this. Sure, sure. But it's interesting, again, as you mentioned, the, 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 the challenges of the, of the two. And uh, bringing the same question over to Jeff, that's one of the things I've noticed sometimes at Finnovate, that companies will arrive at Finnovate being convinced they're 100% B2B, B2C, and then after they're at Finnovate, they talk to a few people, they start to see the B2C light a little bit. How, what's been your experience? I'm seeing the, the, the same thing. You know, companies start as B2C, they move to B2B, and it's happening faster and faster. You know, in addition to the eight companies a year we let in our program, we get hundreds of applications. So I see a right. lot of what entrepreneurs are doing, early stage entrepreneurs. They're now making that pivot essentially immediately. They think, oh, I'm going to be B2C, and then realize, oh, that's too hard. I'm going to go B2B. The, the customer acquisition costs on the consumer side are just too high. I mean, that's what's killing e- even fairly successful fintech companies is your CAC to LTV ratio is off. Venture guys know that, so the financing is tougher for, uh, for B2C. So that's certainly what we're seeing is a move to B2B. The thing about B2C is it's, it's a little bit hit-driven. It's really, really hard, but if you get it right, you know, it's like movies. If you get it right, you've got the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, and you're fabulously wealthy. Uh, and that is a that is a seductive path. That's why everybody still likes to think about consumer. And when someone does get it right, it's it's amazing. 
Yeah, good, good point. Good point. Jason, how about yourself on the B to B versus B to C uh, question? We already get a sense of what uh, what's working for Clank, but maybe your general thoughts on the on the two. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, this is a very, very good uh, question because we've we've conceptualized and spent a lot of time debating at the company both models. So B to mm-hmm. C, B to C is expensive for a company like ours because. We need transaction, you know, users need to be able to log into their bank accounts. And that's frankly expensive if you don't have a lot of cash, right? If you want to roll it out at scale, um, you know, you'll have to go through Yodely or, or Plaid or, or MX or, or one of these aggregators to allow folks to log in. And, you know, there's a cost per user per month that is, is high. So it's hard to, it's, you know, so there's, there is a, a cost problem there. But I'll also say that, so we're B2B to C, right? Because we're building an experience for customers and it's critical to always envision that because the success and the longevity of your integration into a bank or your integration into a financial institution is going to depend on the perceived success of what you've what you've added, right? You don't want to just get a deal for a year and then, you know, customers, it's not really doing anything with customers and then I uh, lose that deal. So I'll use like uh, the deposits as an example of a success where customers loved it and it's a B2B model and, uh, you know, it's, it's been uh, just, just very lucrative. Um, so we build our experience for the customer uh, and you also have to build an experience for the business, but working with financial institutions gives you a, uh, a partnership kind of coverage that uh, is advantageous. So even if you're doing B to B to, you have a B to C vision, um, executing it with a B to B to C model, uh, I think is is just uh, what we found is is a lot more uh, palatable and uh, executable uh, 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 when it comes to just the resistance you'll experience. Yeah. Oh, excellent, excellent. We've got about five minutes left, and uh, it's been a really, really great conversation. And as I suspected, the, the questions are pouring in uh, toward the end here. So let me just go ahead and, and cherry pick one that I think uh, uh, is maybe a good one to to wrap up with. And again, we'll go sort of around the around the table in terms of of the response. And this question is a little bit broad based. And uh, let's see, let me get it here. Um, let me ask you <laughs> this one: uh, Do you think that there is any hope that consumers will start paying? For digital financial services, um, what, how does that uh, factor in in terms of actually getting that uh, actual pocketbook demand, so to speak, for some of these services that we're being provided? Uh, and Kumar, again, let's start with you, if we could. Yeah, we we, we looked into it several times. Um, our, our bank is, as I said in my presentation, it's just a free bank, free ATM, uh, free money transfers, money movements, and then everything is free. So we we did look into uh, look into you know, pay, charging fee for those. A uh, lot of research, and the, uh, the, every time we looked at it, we just didn't think it was the right right time to do that. So at this point, we we're, we're not sure if, if consumers are uh, uh, willing to pay for the digital financial services. Um, so, but but still on our minds. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Jeff, how about uh, your thoughts? Yes, I think they will. In the abstract, yes. Uh, in the yeah. same way that consumers now, you know, 15 years after the start of the Internet, are starting to pay for content. Um, yeah. But it's a question of, of how much and, and which. You know, consumers know that on some level they're, they're paying their banks for services now, so it's just a question of, of what are the economics. You know, maybe it's not $5 a month, it's a dollar a month. Maybe it's not for... Uh, you know, ugh, overdraft protection because that's terrible, but it's for advice. Um, mm. So how much it is and what the model is will shake out and you know, shake out over the next five to ten years, not five to ten months. But I do right. definitely think in the abstract consumers will pay for services that, that they find valuable. Great, great. And a great point about the Internet, the things that you, you think that uh, people would never pay for that, the next thing you know, they're on your, uh, they're on your credit card bill. Uh, Jason, let's go ahead and, and uh, to wrap up your thoughts on, uh, on the issue of paying for digital services. Will consumers, will consumers do it? Yeah, so we've thought about this, too, especially when considering the, B to, the B2C kind of model. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a, it's a tricky question. When you explicitly ask people to pay, you, you're going to get an adoption rate that's slowed. Uh, and in the early stages of a startup, you know, you want to maximize that adoption rate. I think, you know, uh, uh, Kumar kind of touched on that. But uh, beyond that, you know, you can be creative as to the way that they're paying. I mean, if you look at banks right now, 
uh, you know, they kind of just tap your bank account, right? In ways where most people aren't even, don't necessarily even realize how much they're paying or what's going on, what fees are coming out uh, on their credit card or, you know, because they're not paying attention. So, so I mean, I think, uh, you know, as, as Jeff mentioned, this is something that is, is, a, is a evolving uh, with time as to the models that work there. But what we found is right now we just have to demonstrate that, uh, you know, that our product uh, uh, works, right, and that the vision adds real value to people's lives. And so, um, you know, we haven't put further thought, you know, uh, in direct uh, uh, digital uh, sales for the service, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Very good. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all the time we've got for, for now. We've run it up to about 40 minutes, which was, was about what we had scheduled. Uh, I want to thank our panelists uh, very much, Kumar, Jeff, and Jason, for joining us today. We're really happy to get you all uh, as part of our first webinar and uh, very excited to be discussing many of these same topics a few months at our Finnovate Fall event coming up September 11th through the 14th. Uh, it's going to be held at the New York uh, Hilton Midtown. Um, also, as an exclusive for this webinar, you can get 10% off your ticket price by quoting Finnovate Fall Webinar. After two days of Finnovate's inspiring short-form demos, stay on for another day and a half of practical advice from your peers and industry gurus alike. Determine just how you'll incorporate the latest FinTech innovations into your product roadmap. Again, thanks to Kumar, Jeff, and Jason. If you have any feedback on today's webinar or any recommendations for future webinars, please complete a short survey uh, that's available at the end of this webinar, and it should flash up on your screen uh, relatively, sh uh, relatively soon. Uh, and again, don't forget, 10% off your tickets to Finnovate Fall, September 11th through the 14th. All you need to do is quote the code Finnovate Fall Webinar. I want to thank everybody for participating, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.